Well, good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us uh, this evening. I'm Dennis Reardon, president of Minunkatuk Audubon Society, and looking forward to uh, Gina's presentation on flocology. Minunkatuk wishes to honor the indigenous communities native to the chapter area, including the Pagusset, Wepawak, Quinnipiac, Tatakit, Minunkatuk, and Hamanasset people. As we advocate for the conservation of land and its wildlife, we're indebted to the work of Native and Indigenous people who cherished the land for thousands of years before European colonization. I want to draw your attention to some upcoming events. This Friday, um, we're celebrating a year's worth of work on Lights Out in Connecticut with the Lights Out Connecticut Winter Gala. It's at the Community Center in Orange, Friday at seven o'clock. Uh, I'll post a link in the chat to more information about it. But it will involve uh, music, uh, some uh, hors d'oeuvres and mocktails and a general celebration of the work that uh, has been done in the last year. Then Saturday, we have a three-part great backyard bird count in New Haven <clears throat> at three parks in the city. And uh, I'll post a link to that and, and uh, other things as well. Our next program will be Wednesday, February 28th at seven on Zoom with uh, the 2024 legislative pol policy priorities of Audubon for, uh, for this upcoming year with uh, Rob LaFrance, LaFrance the uh, policy director of uh, Audubon, Connecticut. So at this point, let's welcome longtime friend Gina Nickel with another one of her fascinating programs, Flockology. I love that word. It's wonderful to see you all and thank you for tuning in tonight. I see a lot of friends and names that I recognize, so that always makes me excited. And uh, I, uh, I trust that you survived the snowstorm today here in Connecticut, if, you're, if that's where you're uh, tuning in from. Uh, it really feels like winter at the moment, although I was telling Dennis that last week I saw woodcocks displaying at Silver Sands State Park. So uh, spring is coming eventually when the snow melts, I guess. Um, but it was kind of fun to be uh, working on this talk today watching the snowflakes fly. So uh, thank you again for being here. Thank you, Dennis, and all of Manunkatak Audubon Society. You do so much uh, for our community and for the environment. Uh, I'm just so pleased to be a part of it and uh, to be associated with you. And uh, thank you again for having me back. I think the last time I was here, I was talking about how to get better views of birds. Uh, but tonight we are talking about flocology. So let me share my screen and get my program started. Uh, okay. So can you can you all? That's good. See my screen. Okay. So the title is flocology, unraveling the mysteries of bird gatherings. And this is a pandemic project that I did uh, when I took the time to organize a lot of my photos that I take on our various trips and my videos. And I noticed that I had a lot of pictures of bird flocks, gatherings of birds. So I started going through them and it just intrigued me um, about you know why these birds are getting together and, and what they're doing. And so I decided to put together a talk using mostly my um, pictures, but some other people have contributed pictures and I'll, I'll take that at the end. Um, I think maybe the best approach is if 
if people stay on mute for the talk and then we can have a Q&A uh, after the talk. So, uh, you know, I've just, I, as I said, I'm intrigued by why birds gather. And this is a picture that I took at Hammonasset of some great egrets a while back. And obviously they've gathered because there's probably some food in the marsh there that they're all eating. Um, so food is obviously an attractant for birds to get together. What about birds migrating in flocks and how do they fly in flocks of hundreds, thousands of birds without flying into each other? You know, how do they how do they get together? Those were kind of the questions that I was pondering. Why birds form flocks and uh, how they operate within the flock and uh, what advantage it is. Now, my first uh, exposure to bird flocks was uh, probably uh. this movie. Um, the Birds by Alfred Hitchcock that came out in 1963. And it really made me scared of bird flocks. And to this day, when I am with people who see flocks of crows or blackbirds, they utter the birds. You know, everybody knows this movie. Um, and very interesting movie. There were a lot of real birds that were used in the movie. They spent about $200,000 in 1963, which was a lot of money creating mechanical birds. They um, captured gulls at the San Francisco dump and brought them into the movie. But if you saw this movie, you might have uh, a funny feeling about bird flocks. And, and that's kind of how I remember my first exposure to bird flocks. So what are we talking about? Um, I needed to start with a definition of a flock and the Oxford English Dictionary says, a flock is a number of birds of one kind feeding, resting, or traveling together. And the example they give is a flock of gulls, which took me immediately to the 1980s band flock of seagulls, whose hit was I ran, I ran so far away from a bird flock, obviously. Um, but the flocks that I have seen, and I've seen many, many bird flocks, are not just one species. They're a mix of species. This is a feeder at one of the lodges that we stay at when we go to Brazil's Pantanal. And there's five or six species of birds here. So I want to change this definition to say it's a number of birds of any kind feeding, resting, breeding, or traveling together. So I'm just going to create a sunrise birding dictionary definition. So a flock of birds feeding together. And if you have feeders, you see this all the time. But if you go to Japan, and I actually have a group on a tour in Japan right now, and this is what they're going to do tomorrow. They're going to go see some eagles feeding on the ice flows off of Hokkaido in Japan and these birds are gathering on the ice flow because uh, when the ice comes into the harbor, the you can go out on a boat and the fishermen throw some fish onto the ice and it creates a situation where all of these eagles are gathering. So you can see stellar sea eagle up close and personal on the ice right from the boat. You can look at white-tailed eagles um, and photographers love this. It's, it's a great uh, way to get up close and personal with these birds, but it's really the food that draws in. So a flock of birds resting together. Um, we see that a lot if we're out walking on the coast uh, during migration. This is a picture taken in California of western willets and one marbled godwit. You can see the different bird there resting in migration and they're all resting. It's interesting that they're all facing the same direction and sleeping, which is an interesting behavior of flocks. What about a gathering, a flock of long owls? And this picture was taken in Eastern Europe in Serbia. There are about maybe 25 long-eared owls in this picture alone. And these birds gather in a town called Kikinda, right in the town square in the winter, and they overwinter in the town square. So that's a group of long-eared owls resting together. And then, of course, if you find a place that has waterfowl, snow geese, or uh, Canadian geese, um, they'll also rest together and often remain in flocks during their resting time. 
and flocks of birds breeding together. Um, we had the chance a couple of times now to go to Hornoya, Hornoya Island off of Vardo in uh, Norway to a nesting island of, of seabirds, breeding seabirds. And this gives you a little bit of an idea. It's over here off the east coast of the Varanger Peninsula in Norway. Uh, you can get to the, the island and you can walk around amongst 15,000 pairs of common mirrors or maybe 7,500 pairs of black-legged kittiwakes and they're all on the island at the same time breeding. 7,500 pairs of puffins, 1,300 pairs of shags, and 500 pairs of razorbills and, you, and they're all nesting and breeding together. There are these nice shelters that you can sit in and scope up onto the hillside. You can even walk right next to the birds that are nesting. And you look out into the water and there are thousands and thousands of birds. So it's a very productive environment, obviously full of food. And all of these birds are finding enough food to breed and raise their young um, on Hornoya Island, an amazing place to visit. And then of course, flocks of birds that travel together. And there are a lot of uh, birds that do this. Sem these are semi-palmated sandpipers that are migrating north. This picture was taken on the coast of Delaware in May, and these birds are traveling together to their northern breeding ground. And you've seen formations of snow geese and maybe Canada geese in that V formation, which I'll talk about, um, heading north or south in their migration at times. So we're going to use this definition of the number of birds of any kind feeding, resting, breeding, and traveling together. So the question, obvious question is how many birds make a flock? And this is a flock of eared grebes in Baja, California. But how many do you need to make a flock? And there's actually no agreed upon number of how many birds constitute a flock. It can be just a few or it can be hundreds or thousands. And so I don't really know the answer except that probably two's company, three is a flock perhaps. So I'm going to talk about the advantages of birds being in flocks together, the disadvantages, how they navigate in the flock, and we'll have a little fun with some collective names of groups of birds. Now, collective names are interesting because they're not really, I don't think they're ornithological. They're not scientific at all. I'm just going to move my screen so I can see. These are some books that were written about um, collections of birds, an unkindness of ravens, uh, the pigeon one I can't see, a charm of goldfinches, the murmurations of starlings. And um, collective names go way back, they go back to the mid 15th century. And these lists of names for collections of birds were published in handbooks, apparently to educate the nobility. And one quote I read was that they were created as a means of marking out the aristocracy from the less well-bred masses. So if you could t say what a collective name for a group of ravens is, you were uh, an aristocrat versus a less well-bred person. So, so when you go back to these long-eared owls, this collection of long-eared owls, what is, the, what is the collective name for long-eared owls? And actually, there are several. You can call it a bazaar of owls, a parliament of owls, which I've heard before, a stooping of owls, or a wisdom of owls. So what about bar-tailed godwits? Bar-tailed godwits move in flocks heading north on their northward migration. These are males and females. The females are the more dull-colored ones with the longer bills. But the, the collective name for bar-tailed godwits is an ungodliness of bar-tailed godwits. And that's because the black-tailed godwit is a much cleaner looking bird. So whoever gave it the collective name and ungodliness of bar-tailed godwits, that's what they thought. Godliness? I don't think so. Tailed godwits do a migration of nearly 7,000 miles from Alaska down to New Zealand or Australia or Tasmania in about a week or a week and a half. 
when they are moving from their breeding grounds to their wintering grounds. Put a satellite tag on one of these birds and it flew eight and a half thousand miles from Alaska to Tasmania in 11 days, nonstop. Wow. So that's like two and a half trips between New York and London, nonstop. And this was a five month old bird. It made the Guinness Book of World Records. So I don't think ungodliness is the word. I think a miracle of bar-tailed godwits is a much better word for a group of bar-tailed godwits. What about razorbills? Um, this is again a picture taken from Hornoya Island where you are walking right next to the nesting razorbills. And this is when I learned that the inside of their mouths is yellow. I never knew that before. Uh, but of course, a collective name for a group of razorbills is Ed of Razorbills, of course. So let's get into the advantages of the flock. Uh, foraging, of course, is one big advantage because there's more eyes to find food. The more birds you have in a flock, the more chances you'll uh, find food. So these are chestnut-eared arasaris in Brazil, and they're all hanging out together looking to figure out which tree is going to come into fruit and be ready to eat. More eyes, more chances to find food. Now, gulls are are famous for finding food and flocking around food. And this picture was taken in Finland in a place where they put uh, salmon out for bears to come in so people can take pictures of them. And of course there's food there. So black headed gulls and lesser black back gulls and common gulls all show up. And as soon as the bear goes away, the flock is in there uh, feeding on the scraps. And that happens with gulls in a lot of places also cattle egrets, they will hang around large animals. And when the animals move, they sort of kick up stuff out of the grass and the birds uh, will eat it. Now my group that's in Japan today um, experienced this uh, spectacle of cranes in, in Japan coming into an area where there are rice fields. And in the winter, these rice fields are left fallow and the cranes have found this source of food. And I'm gonna try a video here so you can get a sense of sort of how many there are in the racket they're making. I hope you can hear that. So um, these are mostly uh, hooded cranes um, and there's other types of cranes in there. And this is our group from a couple of years ago, getting up close and personal with a spectacular collection of cranes. There's also white named cranes, about 3000 of them there. There's about 10,000 hooded cranes and they're all coming in for the food. The food is a real attract, attract for flocks of birds. Protection is another advantage in the flock. There's safety in numbers. There's a lot of eyes to um, see danger. And whenever you see a flock of birds anywhere, there's always gonna be at least one who's a sentinel. And that one is, it, its head is up and it's watching what's going on, keeping an eye out so that the rest of the birds are protected. And so this is a gathering of birds in Costa Rica. Some of these birds are, um, they're aware of something going on and they've all looked to the left and there's something really going on, some kind of predator or even maybe a person coming toward them and they're all aware. Now, if you go up to Svalbard, you can visit a colony of dove keys and I love dove keys. They're probably the most numerous alcid in the Atlantic, although we rarely get to see them here because they're way further north uh, for us. But if you get to Svalbard, you can walk up to the edge of a colony of dovekeys. And these guys are all feeding together at sea and then coming back to land to, um, to breed and raise their chicks. And if you can get up close and personal with a dovekey, it's really an amazing uh, experience because they're not very big birds, but they have a lot of character. Um, also on Svalbard, you'll find common eiders nesting. Now we get common eiders. Some of them actually stay here in Connecticut in the sound year round, but they go up to the tundra 
the ones that are going to breed. And here are the males with that white and black contrasting plumage and a little bit of green on the back of the neck. And then the females. And the females on the nest, she blends right in. And that's the eider down that they talk about collecting for blankets and jackets and things like that. Now, the problem with nesting on the ground is there are predators. And Arctic foxes are really smart predators. And they will take the eggs and the chicks of the eiders. The eiders have learned that if they have their nesting colony next to the sled dog kennel, the, even though the dogs are in a fence, they uh, make enough noise and they're enough of a threat to the Arctic fox that, that predation is reduced. So they're kind of using those dogs as protection. Oh, clever. So another advantage of the flock is aerodynamics. Uh, birds that travel in flocks can efficiently use energy in flight. And flight takes a lot of energy, as you can imagine. The V formation of geese is not by accident. And if you ever get a chance to watch a V formation, it doesn't stay the same as they move through the sky. There's constant readjusting, constant moving, and even the leader of the, of the V is changing. And so what's happening is the leader is flapping and working really hard for, for the group that's moving. And then the birds behind it are taking advantage of the, the 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 upwash actually the bird flaps and there's a downwash of air but that kind of circles around and comes back up and helps the birds on either side of the leader and that is carried all the way back to all of the birds that are in the v formation and a university of north carolina study found that birds in a v formation stay one wingspan length to the side and one and a half lengths behind the bird ahead of them. And that is the optimal position to get the, the advantage of the updraft. Now, there was a study about 10 years ago with Northern Bald Ibis, and they were trying to uh, reintroduce them to their former breeding ground. But Bald Ibis uh, will breed in an area, and then they uh, winter on the coast of Italy. This actually happened in Italy. And so uh, the birds are breeding north of the Alps in Italy in that green area on the map, if you can see. And researchers put a data logger on 14 young bald ibis to measure their body position and their flight dynamics as they followed an ultralight plane to their wintering ground. It's quite, quite a project that they did. Uh, they had to go around the Alps and follow the ultralight plane to the coast of Italy where they were going to winter. And what they found from the data loggers is birds really pay attention and position themselves in the perfect spot to take advantage of the upwash from the bird ahead of them. So the bird in the front of the V works hard and the bird on the uh, the birds on the end of the V work hard, uh, but the other birds get an advantage of being in the right position. And the birds change position. They don't all only stay in position. So the leader will change over time which is interesting. <laughs> so um, hawks will also take advantage of, of air currents when they are migrating. If you ever spend any time down at Lighthouse Point, you might have witnessed something called a thermal soaring where a cell of air is heated on the ground and it starts to rise up and the birds find it and they start to soar and gain altitude. They kind of soar up with the rising thermal and then they to the top or the of the highest altitude and then just sail down until they find the next thermal and that's just reducing the amount of energy that they need to migrate and kettling it's called kettling what these raptors do is thought to be not only a way of conserving energy but also a way to communicate with other birds that they found this great energy efficient area to rise up and um, move on in migration. So that's quite interesting. So another advantage of being in a flock is mating. Uh, it improves your choice of mates and that there's more mates to choose from. So many birds use something called a lek from the Swedish lekstal, uh, meaning playground, or basically it's an avian disco 
where the males come and gather to display and perform courtship rituals to try and attract a female so that they can mate with her. And this is done with lots of different birds, mannequins, grouse, capercaillies, hummingbirds have leks, birds of paradise have leks, grouse and other birds have leks. So this is uh, quite widely used in the bird world. There's a couple of different kinds of arrangements of lex. Lex, one is classical and one is excluded. The classical lex is when all the males are in visual and auditory range of each other. So this is a lek of uh, greater prairie chickens out in Colorado. And there are four males here just um, coming together to display and try to entice that one female on the left. And I'll try and play a video here and hopefully the sound You'll get an idea of what it's like in this avian disco. So the males kind of strut. They have uh, these bright orange eyebrows and this, these throat patches that they inflate. They kind of uh, walk around sort of hunched over and they'll stomp with their feet. Uh, and it's all to try and get that female to to breed with them. Um, the males will have scraps with each other because they don't like the other males being around. They want the female to themselves. And here's another video showing a little bit closer the kinds of displays that they do. He seems interested. But but maybe not. She seemed to walk away. But it's really comical to watch if you ever get a chance to see it. Um, it's really amazing. So talking about greater prairie chickens, I kind of did a little bit of research on the greater prairie chicken that used to live on the East Coast, R1 called the heath hen. And as a matter of fact, at Hammonasset, there were heath hens living there uh, back in the early 1900s, late 1800s. And you can see the range map here. The greater prairie chickens range was in the middle part of the US and here was the heath hen. Um, so as I did some research about the heath hen, there was a movement afoot in Martha's Vineyard to bring the heath hen back from extinction and using DNA. And so there are heath hen skins, you know, in, in museums and scientific collections. And the thought was that you could um, get the DNA of the heath hen, put it into the egg of a chicken and uh, hatch it out and grow heath hens and restore them to their previous habitat, bringing them essentially back from extinction. And I, I thought about this, and I heard about this before somewhere. It's an interesting, interesting idea. But did that with dinosaurs in Jurassic Park, didn't they? And that didn't work out so well. And I spoke to some people in Martha's Vineyard about it, and they said, yeah, the problem really is that there's not habitat for the heath hen. And so probably there's not habitat for dinosaurs either, and that's why that didn't work out. But, um, Anyway, uh, I don't know if we'll get our heath hen back, but it's an interesting idea. But anyway, the second type of lek is the exploded lek, where the males are visible uh, or not visible, but within earshot of each other. And if you've heard turkeys gobbling, the adult, uh, males that are doing their dances um, usually can't see each other. Sometimes they're together, but most, a lot of times they're just in auditory earshot, and that's called an exploded lek. My favorite lek is the rough lek. And rough are shorebirds that we see heading on their northward migration when we do our spring migration trip in Lesbos. And lots of the birds you see feeding here are, are rough, uh, the big brown shorebird. And they're a few weeks away from making it to their northern breeding grounds in Norway. And this is what the bird looks like. Here's a, a drawing of the bird. Uh, the male is called the rough, the female is called the reeve. 
this is a picture of a female. She looks the same all the time, but there are actually three types of male morphs that are genetically predetermined at birth, three types of male. And the first one is the independent male, and this is the one that's actually gonna get to breed. He, by the time it gets to the breeding grounds, it has grown this ruff of feathers, these, these display feathers, um, and they can be brown and colored, or they can be black and white. And this is the male ruff on the breeding ground, independent version, the one that's gonna get to breed. But there's also one that develops mostly white feathers and it's called a satellite. And this one will not get to breed ever. Um, and I call it a wingman because what it does is helps the independent ruff look good for the females. And so they'll still display and fight on the lek, but that, um, that wingman will never get a chance to breed. So here's them displaying. He's making the independent look good by being docile and showing the female that the independent is really the guy to mate with. There's that third type of male called a fodder, and the fodder looks like a female. It has female uh, plumage, and it doesn't display on the lek. What it does is instead of fighting on the lek, it blends with the females and occasionally occasionally mates with them. So he's called a sneaker male. He looks like a female. He sneaks in while the other males are displaying on the lek. Very, very sneaky. Ruffs are so cool. So um, more advantages of being in a flock is breeding success when birds all are breeding together, like here on Michaelmas Key uh, at the Great Barrier Reef. There are sooty terns and brown noddies by the hundreds, all breeding in the same area. And if there's ever any threat or any predator, the word gets out immediately. And uh, if you've ever been visited a tern colony, they'll attack you if you get too close. So there's a real advantage of breeding in a colony. Gannets do the same thing. These are Australasian gannets. We saw, we visited this colony uh, in New Zealand a couple of years ago, and you can see the gannets on the ground there. Uh, the view from above is really interesting because talk about social distancing. These are all gannets that are nests, and the nests are spaced out sort of within, just outside of Bill's reach from each other. So they're together, but they have their own space. So again, if you visit a turn colony at Sandy Point or, or somewhere else along the Connecticut coast, if you ever get a chance to take a boat around Faulkner's Island, you see all these birds, these turns breeding together and sort of getting the advantage of that, advantage of numbers. And here's the least turn that um, breeds on Sandy Point most years, sometimes successfully. And if you walk along the beach there and you get too close to the breeding colony, you know, they'll attack you. What's interesting is other birds take advantage of this too. The piping plovers breed there. They, all they can do is, is run away if there's danger, but because the terns are so aggressive in protecting their young, the piping plovers get the benefit of that by breeding nearby them. And so do the black skimmers. Black skimmers will be aggressive if you get too close to their nest, but they're really benefiting by being with the terns and nesting in the same colony. Now, another cool advantage of being in a flock is childcare. Um, interestingly, the greater rhea and ostriches, it's the male who will actually breed with a number of females and then they'll all lay their eggs in the nest and he will incubate them and take care of them. It goes further than that. Some penguins and other species of birds nest in colonies together and when they go out fishing to get food for their chicks, they put their babies in a creche, in a daycare center. So these are all young Gentoo penguins that have been left by their parents under the care of some watchful adults while the parents have gone out to find fish to feed their chicks. And these few babysitters, these watchful adults, take care of the babies until the adults come back and find their own chick and feed it. So, Indian daycare and flamingos do it. 
Uh, geese do it, royal turns, sandwich turns, eiders do it, common mergansers, uh, ostriches and penguins. And there was a report some years ago about a female duck, I think she was a common merganser, who was spotted with a brood of 76 ducklings that she was taking care of that day. So that's pretty cool. So let's talk about navigating in the flock. One of the questions that I had was, you know, these birds that gather, how do they keep from flying into each other? Um, and this is a flock of the beautiful trees uh, swallows that we see at Hammonasset uh, that are nesting there and then um, in the boxes that Manunkatak Audubon put up. And then they are all gathering late in the summer, getting ready to migrate. Um, and they'll start gathering together and drinking and moving around in murmurations until eventually later in the fall, they will head south for the winter. So they are pretty widespread throughout the U.S. and then they go down to uh, the area in purple where they winter. But before they do that, they gather by the hundreds of thousands, maybe a million, and they roost every night in, in late August into September into October at the mouth of the Connecticut River. And I think Manunkatuck has, has taken some boat rides, taken some people to see this, one of the greatest, uh, nature's greatest spectacles, according to Roger Torrey Peterson is the gathering of tree swallows in the lower Connecticut River. And we I have been able to see this from land and also from uh, by boat. It is a spectacle if you ever get a chance to see it. And so what happens is these birds at dusk, they start to fly into the lower Connecticut River and then they create these murmurations. And here's a video. Hopefully you can see the little speck a little hard to see, but you, you get the idea. And they're all tree swallows, hundreds of thousands of tree swallows that are meeting to survey their uh, nightly roosting area and make sure there are no predators there. European starlings are well known for doing this. It's called a murmuration. And Christmas a few years ago, I asked uh, Steve to take me to see a murmuration. And this is a murmuration in England of um, European starlings. Uh, and again, you see these amazingly choreographed birds all moving in unison and, and turning on a dime. And it looks like a ballet. It looks like an avian ballet. It's just incredible to witness. So there are starling murmurations all around England, and apparently they're being seen at Hammonasset now. So if you ever get a chance to see a bunch of starlings doing their thing at Hammonasset, it's really amazing. And um, just a few videos to show you how dramatic these are. These are all starlings, and they're all moving together. And then sometimes they'll go down into the marsh. It's usually over a marsh. And these guys are um, bathing and getting ready to go to bed for the night. They're taking their nightly bath before they roost for the night. And it looks a little chaotic, but you never see them running into each other. So how do they do it? How do they um, move together and not run into each other? And uh, in 2013, Princeton did a study of the movements and positions of birds in starling flocks. And they analyzed the movements with MATLAB software and found a magic number. They found that each bird keeps track of seven of its closest neighbors and makes its moves in coordination with just seven of its neighbors. So the, the uh, study came out from Princeton that that's how these birds flock together. In fact, on that movements of the flock are not organized by any leader of the flock, not like that goose that is the leader of the, the V formation. And somehow large flocks have an instinctive need to maintain the optimal density in the flock. So they need to say they spaced out from each other so every bird can see outside the flock. So every bird can see if there's danger. That's what optimal density is. And so when you look at these 
bird flocks, you can see each individual bird. There's so many of them, it's hard to, it's hard to see just one, but they, you can see between each bird. And the optimal density of the flock is maintained as the birds move and swirl and keep track of seven of their neighbors. All move in unison. A University of Warwick study said that each individual bird has the same information and instincts and they all behave in the same way at the same time, which is hard to believe, but it seems like that's what actually happens. It's incredible. So in the background of this picture is, this is the tree swallows again, doing the same thing. If a predator flies to the flock, the birds separate, and I've seen this, merlins will fly in and try to hunt the birds. The birds go apart, and then when the predator's gone, they come back together. Incredible, incredible. And what they're actually doing then is just surveying their um, their nightly roost. And at some point they feel it's safe to go to the roost and they rain out of the sky into the marsh. And then they perch on the marsh grass for the night. And I don't know if you can see, but these birds are raining right into the marsh. They're going straight down into the marsh. Incredible spectacle. Wow. Oh, okay, a few more collective names. Let's see what we have. The Hwatsin. A Hwatsin is a kind of a tree turkey of, of South America. Um, and it's a big bird that eats leaves and it actually can digest leaves um, through ru uh, rumination, similar to what cows do. <laughs> so they're a really unique bird. But a group of Hwatsins is called a herd of Hwatsins, just like a herd of about a group of turkeys. These are oscillated turkeys in Belize, and they are called a rafter or a flock of turkeys. And flamingos, one of my favorite types of birds. These are Andean and James flamingos in uh, Argentina. And of course, they're called, a group is called a flamboyance of flamingos. So let's talk about some disadvantages of the flock. Of course, when you're gathering in such large numbers, it increases your visibility. And so you're more visible to predators and that can be a problem. It's, it's a blessing because there's more eyes to see danger, but it also will attract attention. So all of these birds that are moving in flocks have that one disadvantage. And even though shorebirds like these semi-palmated plovers sort of blend into the substrate, blend into the rocks on the shore where they're, um, where they're roosting or feeding, predators can still find them because they're in big flocks. It's very obvious. Um, here's a flock of snow geese and sandhill cranes. You know, it's not a quiet situation at all, but boy, if a coyote comes by or something like that, the birds all know it and they either flee or, you know, take action to avoid uh, problems. There's also a lot of competition for resources if you're packed together in a flock. Um, these are gulls on the west coast of California. Um, they're on the shore, there's the sea, but on the lower part of the picture, there's a little freshwater stream that's coming in and they all want to use that bathe. And so they're all in competition for, uh, to eat, uh, with each other to use the freshwater for bathing. And of course, when birds group together, it can really cause diseases to spread quickly. And uh, you may have, maybe it's still going on, the, the finch eye disease, um, when finches are gathering at feeders, it's easy for them to spread this eye disease. Um, in the lakes in Kenya, the flamingos, when there's an avian flu or some kind of a, a pathogen there, it spreads very quickly because the birds are tightly packed. And the same things happens in penguin colonies or any place where birds are gathering is the chance for uh, disease to spread very quickly. And right now, uh, bird flu is a concern. This is the recent numbers of birds um, diagnosed with bird flu, which is really mostly a problem in chicken farms, but it is in the wild bird population. This year, we've had about four um, 
cases reported in Connecticut. So that's one of the reasons why you don't want to pick up a dead bird. You want to report it to the DEP or U.S. Fish and Wildlife. But that's one of the problems with associating in flocks. Um, the risk to humans is pretty low, but it's probably a good idea not to handle a dead bird but to just report it. All right, a few more collective names. So if there's a group of ping, uh, king penguins together and they're in the water, it's called a raft of king penguins. Or if they're on land, it's called a waddle because that's what they do when they're on land. And how about Mississippi kites when they get together in a group? And this is a migratory group. Uh, they're called a brood or a kettle or a roost or a stooping or a string of kites. I like that one. And Lear's macaws, beautiful macaws of Brazil, just simply called a flock of macaws. You don't need to say anything else. So part two of this uh, talk, when I, whenever I get it together, will be to look more carefully at mixed flocks. And, you know, we run into mixed flocks all the time. And there's a question as to what are the roles of the birds in the flock? Do they use the same resources? or do they use different resources if they're all say, foraging together? And some of the uh, information that's come out that I found is that, yes, they are taking different roles in the flock, some feeding on the ground, some feeding at mid-level. Um, and that's just a new, well, for me, a new topic to be explored. But I started researching it, and I found this article uh, put out by the Florida Museum of Natural History and it said that um, bird flocks with multiple species behave like K-pop groups. And that's when I realized that I had a lot more to learn <laughs> because I didn't even know what a K-pop group. So I looked that up and this is a K-pop group. BTS is a K-pop group. And apparently the point of the article, which was a little bit over my head, was that everybody in this group has a different role. They do something different. Uh, but I'll have to get back to uh, learning about bird flocks and, and how they operate. But in the meantime, I hope that um, you can see lots of birds and, um, and marvel at bird gatherings and try to uh, observe and get some understanding of what's going on when birds gather. and um, and enjoy the birds that are outside. And I thank you very much. Uh, this is my contacts. And I hope we've unraveled at least some of the mysteries of bird gatherings. So I guess if there are questions, I'll try, <laughs> try to answer them. Chat. Okay. Uh, Olivia, you want to unmute yourself? Oh, yeah, I was, I just was curious how those birds in the beginning could fly 11 hours without sleeping, but then somebody responded that they can turn their brains off, which I found yep. interesting. <laughs> incredibly adapted for migration. They're incredibly adapted to survive this amazing journey that they do. And there's a lot of new information that's coming out. And one, you know, one fact is is that they can let half their brain sleep while the other half is alert. Wouldn't that be good if we could do that? I'd love yeah, that. that would be wonderful <laughs> if I could do that. <laughs> you know, some of these birds will also sort of resor resorb or reduce the size of uh, their organs so that they're not so heavy. They can be um, less heavy for migration. I mean, it's really an incredible, um, they're incredibly adapted for these kinds of journeys. It's amazing, just amazing. Well, thank you. Thank you, that was a wonderful talk. Thank you. Michael, you had a question? I'm looking in the chat. Um, Michael said, does ground feeding of birds attract flocks, which attracts flocks, increase the risk of disease transmission? Um, it, any kind of bird gathering could do that. 
uh, I guess so. The answer is it's possible. Yes, I'm not sure where you're going with that question, but but yes, for sure. I mean, that's why when we put even put out bird feeders, um, we're told to maintain them to keep them clean. You know, so that if there are any pathogens or just if there's any mold or anything happening at the feeder, it can be cleaned up and not cause a problem for the birds. Anybody other else? questions? Uh, any, any other questions? So I think I was telling um, Dennis before the talk, and maybe I, I mentioned it in the talk, that um, we do have lecking birds here in Connecticut. And when the woodcocks gather to do their display flights, that that is a lek. And I told Dennis that it's already happening in the, at Silver Sands State Park down in Milford. Uh, so uh, I don't know what's going to happen now with this snow cover. Uh, it makes it hard for the woodcocks, although I think this probably will melt pretty quickly and they just need to find soft ground to feed. But it creates a problem for woodcocks, especially when they return so early in the season. But they're already at it. I heard them painting and display flighting a week ago. <laughs> Unbelievable. Yes. All right. Thank you very much, Gina. My pleasure. Great presentation as always. Oh, thank you. And thanks everybody for coming, tuning in tonight. And uh, check the, the uh, links in the chat or look for an email tomorrow with, uh, with links for upcoming events and uh, um, next program.